Thank you for creating some space, really, uh, for us to reflect together. <clears throat> I think the, the, the sentiment we gather uh, around is one of solidarity uh, and one of um, searching as well as we as we figure out how to move into a, a more pandemic conscious future. <clears throat> because I think whether it's pandemics or it's heat waves or uh, excess winter deaths, the, the reality is in terms of questioning what we mean by resilience, it's fair to say that um, challenges are going to exist out ahead. Um, the last 20 weeks, depending on which jurisdiction you found yourself in, we, we work in about 35 countries around the world. So we've been quite close up to the work in Singapore uh, over the last 20 weeks or so. Has really been striking, not just in terms of public health, but also in terms of economic uh, injustice and, of course, um, the, uh, the, ki the police killing of George uh, Floyd has also brought home uh, some very, very serious uh, deficits, really, in how our institutions function and the issue of institutional racism, which is not just peculiar uh, to uh, the USA. Um, so so it, it's, it's been an incredibly intense time. And I wanted to reflect together about uh, how resilience as a lens may be useful in this regard. In thinking about resilience, I, I think one of the cautions that I have or one of my um, anxieties around using the term is, is that I think it's open to abuse or at least to misinterpretation. When I think of resilience, I think of, for example, the built-in resilience that a forest has uh, after a bushfire, an actual fire to, uh, to recover. Uh, in, ecolo in, in ecological terms, they call it succession, where the plants that begin to reemerge are the ones uh, where essentially they're seeded from the soil that's already there and has survived. And, and I suppose in a sense, I like that idea of resilience, that idea that we will use what we have to secure what we need to move forward, to prevail. I think that's a really positive and important message. But, but as I think about the challenges of public health and the challenges of economic injustice and the challenges of a structural racism, it strikes me that George Floyd's words are poignant across all three challenges. I can't breathe. I can't breathe. I can't breathe. So to my mind, whether we're in the public sector in this call or we're in the third sector or we're thinking about ourselves as people who live in neighborhoods, the question before us is, is what are we going to do to show up in the lives of the people we care about and we love and we serve in a way that means as guests in their lives, to use Rob's lovely turn of phrase, that they're more likely as a consequence of us being in their lives to say, I can breathe free. You see, to my mind, one of the great problems with an awful lot of these discussions is they nearly always get pulled back to services and programs and money as opposed to social justice and social change. And I think one of the reasons why the work over the last 10 years, particularly in the UK for me, has been so nourishing is, is that where we've learned most about social justice is uh, at the feet of citizens, uh, at the feet of local people living in real communities across the UK as well as across the world who are teaching us again and again that when institutional capacities each, you know, reach the necessary limits of what they can do, that's often when we see the revelation of this incredible reservoir of resource and potential in our communities. And I think it's important to recognize that that didn't just come in the shape of volunteering. It came in the shape of citizenship. It came in the shape of neighborliness. It came in the shape of ordinary people doing extraordinary things in their own lives and in the lives of their neighbors, uh, many of whom would not necessarily think of what they were doing as volunteering um, or in any way as a big deal, but they did it nevertheless. And I think that has had a very, very significant impact. And it's great to see the likes of The Lancet beginning to acknowledge the importance of community participation and recognizing that volunteering, while crucial, is just a subset 
of community engagement and how people participate across the UK and across the world is bigger than just volunteering. It's bigger than how we classically understand what it is uh, people do when they try to make change happen uh, in their lives or the lives of their neighbours. And somehow it's more ordinary as well. It's a kind of a, it's, it's a little bit of a conundrum. I wanted to share some stories as uh, I reflect with you into what we mean when we talk about resilience of ordinary people living in neighbourhoods or living in villages. And I think it's helpful for us as we think into a pandemic conscious future, because I'm not sure uh, a post-COVID future is necessarily a useful framing. Um, I think one of the things that we could imagine creatively into is the idea that we change how we understand the units of change. And we stop imagining that change is about behavior change in individuals. And we stop imagining that change is simply about our institutions doing a better job or our politicians reforming how they show up and start as well to imagine that the neighborhood, that the small bounded place is actually a potent unit of change. We're learning in all kinds of ways, actually, that when institutions in the third sector and in the public sector start thinking about themselves as precipitators of change in neighborhoods and in villages, and not just as you know, providers of services, that all kinds of things are possible. For example, in Vorstad, which is in Deventer in the Netherlands, there was an issue in the uh, neighborhood, which was around uh, race relations. A Syrian family had uh, essentially been um, victims of hate crime in the neighborhood of Vorstad. But what was interesting was that the third sector organizations and the public sector organizations said, if we're going to resolve this issue, as well as creating an alternative uh, placement or home uh, for the family away from the issue of racism, we need to figure out how we're going to have a conversation with the people who live in the neighborhood of Vorstad, which changes the experience for people who are experiencing racism, but also begins a new conversation with people who are behaving uh, in a racist manner. So they began to reach out, the professionals who were serving this neighborhood began to reach out to the local associations in the neighborhood. You see uh, in the uh, image there two, uh, two associations. One is the football club, so you can see some folks sitting in the stadium uh, cheering on their team, the Eagles, uh, local football club there. But also you see the Knit and Natter group. And it's interesting to think that a professional would think to reach out to the local football club and also the Knit and Natter group and other associations in the neighborhood and say, could we have a conversation about what you want to do to create places of welcome within your community, especially for those most vulnerable to having their gifts not seen or received and most susceptible to race crime? And these communities stepped up in all kinds of I think remarkable ways, ways that I don't think could come out of an institution. One of the things that the Knit and Natter group said they'd like to do with the football club was to actually knit a three kilometer scarf that they wrapped around the community, making a very clear demonstrable statement that this is a neighborhood which has a place of welcome for the stranger and can actually welcome in people from all parts of the planet. They also wanted to reach out to the family. The Knit and Natter group actually wanted to have a conversation with the Syrian family that had essentially left out of fear uh, and fled the neighborhood. And in the process of having the conversation with the family about what would need to happen for the family to return, they knit a scarf that wrapped around the house of the family. Again, a public demonstration that they stood in solidarity with the family. Um, an expression or a word that's used in the in the Netherlands is geselig, which translates as cozy or a place of welcome. So uh, there's nothing as cozy as a, a scarf, but having one wrapped around your house and having neighbors stand in solidarity and saying, we stand shoulder to shoulder with you and we will figure out together how we create a place of welcome. I think it creates an interesting and a different sense of what we mean by resilience. You see, resilience is where the seeds of welcome can blossom even against the challenges, not in spite of them, but actually 
because of them. It's interesting that in the conversations that were had with folks who were actually being racist in their behaviours, what these local people were able to do was get past ideology and get into biography and actually discovered that many of the behaviours that people were manifesting, which were unacceptable, were behaviours that they had received uh, rather than they believed. And beginning to open up a new culture of possibilities where people are resilient and the, the resilience is measured not by the strength of the leadership or by silly childlike narratives about we're in war against racism or we're in war against COVID because we're not at war. And instead being the adults in the room that says a resilient community is a community that can have difficult conversations and can make change happen in a way that includes those we actually find objectionable and we can bring their voice in too and create real change at the cultural level. I think what they were doing, and I think what we mean by resilience is they were, they were surfacing the seeds that exist within their community, the resources or the assets. I love this slide that NDTI often share, uh, which shows that in every community, there are invisible resources. We call them assets, but resources is probably more of a, a vernacular term, which I think are at the heart of what we need to begin to grow, not just a response to pandemics, but a response to economic challenges that lie ahead. And I don't think these are economic challenges specific to this moment in time. The invidious choices that people are making between their lives and their livelihoods at the moment are choices that many people have had to make for decades and that many others will have to make for decades to come. So how do we do something about surfacing the assets and the resources within local communities that create local economies where people have an economic floor, as well as figuring out how we advance narratives and important discussions about, for example, universal citizen income. I, I think one of the ways of certainly doing it is beginning the conversation where people live their lives and uh, beginning to figure out what is it that exists at local neighborhood level that people can discover connect and mobilize. And I think regardless of the challenges we're facing, regardless of the issues that we will face, in every community, there are an abundance of the six resources of the assets you see listed here. I don't have time to list them all, but you can, you can, you can review them yourselves. So I think the challenge in terms of creating and nurturing uh, abundant and resilient communities is enabling people to make visible, the invisible, because this is the great irony. Most of these assets are not visible. In, in a sense, most of what people do to be healthy, for example, they're doing while not thinking I'm doing this to be healthy. So in all kinds of ways, just as we saw over the last 20 weeks or so, less for some, some people, what I think we're beginning to recognize is there's a reservoir of competency and capacity in communities that isn't visible to the untrained eye. But at certain times, certain precipitants make the invisible visible. And in a sense, that's what COVID did. It immediately revealed the limits of the institutional world. And at the same time, it revealed the capacities of the non-institutional civic space. And it also helped us see what, what was the sweet spot that joined those two spaces together? We saw that through volunteering. We saw it through citizenship. We, throw, we saw it through service. We saw it through, again, expressions of vocational contribution, not just professionalism, but vocational contribution, where people made sacrifices of immense emotional toll uh, to themselves and their families. But we also saw it at the neighborhood level. And often it's at the neighborhood level because it doesn't have the, uh, the glass of the expert or the glass of the institution or the resource of the formal uh, organization that we miss the fact that there is an incredible recipe in every neighborhood just waiting to be mixed into uh, you know, the, right, the, the, the right combination. One of the things that I think has been clear over the last number of weeks is, is that communities at local level have been taking on functions. How many of us on this call uh, have struggled to take on the function of teaching our own at home, of being the wisdom, the primary educators of our children? Not easy to do when you're trying to work or deal with the anxiety of uh, being in lockdown 
but somehow we cobbled it together and managed. Uh, we we took on the function of educating, of raising our children and 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 teaching them. But also we saw people enabling health. In my own community, we have enabled a number of people who, uh, for various reasons, uh, wanted to uh, end their end of life experience at home and die at home. Um, and practicing physical distancing, we've been able, with the support of just some awesome people within the hospice who largely precipitated our efforts uh, to be alongside our neighbors uh, as they ended their life as they would have wished um, at homes and uh, with dignity. Um, we've also seen in our neighborhoods and in neighborhoods around the world how being really around and connected to our neighborhood has produced security and a sense of safety at a time of great anxiety. We've seen people think much more about their ecologies, their local places. I'm seeing uh, neighborhood beautification schemes uh, like never before in neighborhoods, spawning, I think, from the fact that we spent so much time at home and actually so much time in our in our built environments. We're also seeing people think very creatively about their local economies, about food sovereignty and about what it actually means to raise our children again. I think one of the things we've also seen people take an active function around is care, is figuring out how we can be there for our neighbors and how we can care for each other, not as a program or as a, a service, but as a freely given gift of the heart, one person to another, near neighbors, not salaried strangers. Now, why are all these functions so important? And why, if, for example, going forward, we were to find a positive precipit precipitant to them? Because in a sense, COVID-19 is a negative precipitant to all of these functions. But I think the third sector is a positive precipitant. I think clever public sector supports, good foundation supports, are positive precipitants. Why would we want to have more precipitation of citizen-led action and not just the provision of stock services? What might be the evidence to say this is a good idea? Well, the evidence is that uh, we would want to do that because it leads to better outcomes. In terms of e economics, um, we're, we're facing tough times ahead in terms of economies. Those with deep social networks at the local level are four times more likely to get a job than those who simply and solely have support uh, from a job center. Now, it doesn't mean that having both isn't desirable. In fact, I would argue it is. But we shouldn't have one at the expense of another. It's about how do we combine those two supports? Many of you I know will be familiar with the work uh, of the town in Froom, but it's fascinating to compare the impact in terms of the reduction in demand of services, uh, GP and uh, hospital services uh, in Froom, uh, which is in the county of Somerset, went down by 17% at the same time as we were seeing a 29% increase across the county. So what was going on there? Well, in both instances, what we're seeing is that we are investing in the precipitation of neighbor to neighbor connection and enabling them not just to be connected with each other and have nice activities, but be productive, be creative, take on functions that make a difference. So it's not just about, you know, it's a nice thing to do or befriending schemes or feeding or getting prescriptions, but it's a whole range of other things as well as and this is why I want to call our attention, not just to relief action. You know, it, it's not just about responding to crisis. Resilient communities are focused on community renewal. And so in a way you could say that for a long time, the reason that perhaps communities didn't recognize their own resilience and their own capacity for renewal is that so many of the seven functions that I've mentioned and the six assets that I've mentioned we're kind of outsourced to the institutional world. And, and you know, so much of this stuff is done to us. Our health is done to us. Our, our education is done for us. Maybe sometimes with us if we're lucky. But what we've seen in the last 20 weeks are so many things that were actually led by and done by citizens, done and led by volunteers, almost because the need demanded it so. But what might be possible if we thought about that into the future, not just as an emergency response, but as the way resilience communities show up? Why? 
because that's our culture. It's not just about random acts of kindness. It's about rooted acts of kindness in our culture. This is our way of doing things around here. See, it's almost like a Russian doll, isn't it? Where at the heart of a democracy is a citizen connected in association with other citizens. The difficulty is, is that we're living through a time when there's an inversion in democracy. When so many people think that the role of the professional is primary, that, you know, in a sense, the, the role of the citizen is defined as that which happens after the important work of the professional is done. What we've learned over the last few weeks is, is that actually in a democracy, it's the other way around. The role of the professional is defined as that which happens after the important work of citizens is done. Because in so many ways, the frontline first responders in COVID-19, as we see the emergence of new spikes, when it comes to the economic challenges of our future, when it comes to social justice, are us in our neighborhoods, citizen to citizen, the primary responders, in a sense, what I'm calling your attention to is, is a kind of a shift in focus that starts with this idea that citizenship is the primary and first course of response. And in a sense, the neighborhood is the primary unit of change, seeing citizens as producers and then figuring out how, as they're in the front or in the driving seat, we can be supporters in the back seat. One of the challenges, I think, to community uh, resilience is community degradation, where outside agencies are coming in and taking over and doing to and for. Uh, we all know Lao Tzu's great saying, you know, that's of the great leader, they will say when he is gone, we did it ourselves. So this is a little play on that. Where community degradation and resilience is harmed, the sentiment is, let's go to the people with an agenda, find out what is wrong with them, tell them what, we, what, what to do, enable and fix them, Start with what they don't have, boast about what we do have, tell them what, we th what they should think, and then they will say, when we are gone, of the worst leaders, what have they done to us? What have they done to us? Resilience isn't about communities saying, boy, we got a great service. Resilience is about communities saying, I think, we know what it is we can do best and we do it. We know where we need help and we get it. And we also know what we need outside agencies to do for us. And they do it in a transparent, equitable and democratic way. And that's why our resilience isn't harmed, but it's enhanced with services there in supplement of our resilience, not as a replacement to it. Thank you.